Thank you for joining us for the second plenary session. It will be on Caring Society for Social Sustainability, and the session will be moderated by Professor Hee-Gang Kim at the Department of Public Administration at Korea University. Good morning, Professor Kim. Hello, welcome. We will begin the plenary session of Global Engagement and Empowerment Forum on Sustainable Development 2022. I am Hee-Gang Kim from Korea University and the moderator of this session. Uh, the theme of this plenary session is Caring Society for Social Sustainability. While the COVID-19 has threatened our everyday lives for more than two years, the meaning of care is becoming more and more important to us. The plenary session proposed to revisit the meaning of care and in the era of pandemic and expand the application of the new meaning of care. So such a proposed three distinguished speakers representing each field of our society, economics, political science, and art are invited in this session. I am very honored to introduce these three speakers to you. First, please welcome Professor Nancy Forbre. Hello, Professor. And Professor Forbre is Professor Emerita of Economics and Director of the Program on Gender and Care Work at the Political Economy Research Institute at University of Massachusetts Amherst and a Senior Fellow of Levy Economics Institute at Bard College in the United States. She is the author of many books, including The Rise and Decline of patriarchal system, greed, lost, and gender, and the invisible hurt. Hello, Professor. And next, welcome, please, welcome, pre Professor John Toronto. Hello, Professor Toronto is Professor Emerita of Political Science at the University of Minnesota and the City University of New York. She is the author of many books, including Moral Boundaries, Caring Democracy, and Who Cares How to Reshape a Democratic Politics. Professor Toronto was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University for Humanistic Studies in the Netherlands and won the Brown Prize for Democracy. Hello, Professor. And finally, welcome, please welcome Mr. Taeyun Che. <laughs> Mr. Che is an artist, educator, and organizer who works with drawing, painting, computer programming, performance art, and video. His projects were presented at the New Museum of Contemporary Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and more. And he is also, he was a fellow at the IBM Art and Technology Center, Low Manhattan Culture Council, Pioneer Network, and more. He also taught at New York University, Parsons School of Design, and the City University of New York. Hello, welcome. Uh, then from now on, we will have a presentation by our speakers. The order will be as shown in the, on, on our program. First, the Professor Forbre, please proceed your presentation. The topic to be presented is Care Economy in Korea Beyond COVID-19 and Toward a Sustainable Caring Society. Professor Kim, thank you so much for your um, kind introduction. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, hope you'll bear with me for a minute while I share my screen. So I'd like to start, um, particularly since I'm sharing the podium with uh, John Tronto, uh, with a comment on moral values and economic interests. In my view, care for others is first and foremost a moral commitment, but I believe it's also 
very important to show that it is an economic necessity. Care is costly in the short run, but generally pays off in the long run. And what I wanna emphasize is that our economic institutions are not sufficiently attentive to its long run benefits. In particular, we can no longer rely on measures of gross domestic product or GDP as a measure of our collective output or as an indicator of our economic success. In other words, we need some fundamental changes to our economic accounting system. A big problem is that GDP doesn't include the value of unpriced assets, ecological services such as a stable climate or unpaid work nor does that measure subtract the money that's spent on social bads, money spent on pollution, resource depletion, crime, drugs, suicide, depression, whatever. So it's really not a, an indicator of what we all care about the most. And in particular, I'm interested in um, the implications of demographic change for the way that we think about uh, economic accounting systems. And I know that South Korea is a global example of a transition to below replacement fertility rates, um, but it's now almost half the global population living in countries with below replacement fertility. And this is something that economists have only recently acknowledged is a source of economic strain um, along with other global challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. But one of the interesting things about um, these trends is that they are forcing us to reevaluate the way we think about and measure our economic progress. So in redirecting your attention to the care economy or the care sector of the economy, I wanna be very uh, very clear, very specific about what, what I mean by that. And I define the care economy as the set of activities and also investments that produces and develops and maintains human capabilities. Um, so it's very similar in some respects to the concept of human capital, but it's broader than that because it looks beyond a rate of return in the market to think about benefits for society as a whole. So the care sector includes both paid work, child care workers, elder care workers, health care, education, social services, but it also includes the unpaid work that's provided by family and community members, unpaid work that many countries, including Korea, measure at least to some extent through systematic time use surveys that allow us to know exactly how much is performed. So care provision, whether it's paid or unpaid, has some pretty distinctive features. And it's very important to understand these features um, in order to have a sense of the dynamics of care provision, especially within a larger capitalist market economy. Care provision, and again, whether it's paid or unpaid, is motivated to some extent by obligation, by responsibility, by affection, by altruism, as well as economic self-interest. Care providers themselves need to survive. They need support, they need uh, recognition. Care provision is less about voluntary exchange in markets which is typically the feature, the focus of economic analysis. And it's, it's more about transfers, transfers of time and transfers of money to dependents, children, the elderly, the sick, people suffering from disability. A really important economic feature of care provision is it's difficult to capture the value added uh, in providing a service to those who need it. You're not producing a commodity that can easily be bought and sold uh, or measured, or that is really subject to the forces of supply and demand in the marketplace. And another really important distinctive feature is that care provision has positive spillovers, sometimes called externalities. P 
people benefit other than the most immediate recipients. So we all benefit uh, from raising healthy, happy, productive children and taking care of our elderly um, members of society in an effective and, and kind and caring way. And partly because of these economic characteristics that make it difficult to rely on market forces, care provision is not always efficiently produced by capitalist enterprises. So uh, we are facing a lot of problems with both the quantity and the quality of services that are provided. So a very quick overview of some kind of global changes uh, in, in the care economy. For most of the 20th century, we saw pretty rapid population growth due to high fertility combined with mortality decline. But in the 21st century in particular, we've seen pretty rapid fertility decline, um, as I mentioned, to below replacement rates um, in many countries, including Korea. And I think this transition to uh, lower fertility rates has been neglected and misunderstood by conventional economic theory. And in order to understand it, we really have to look at both patriarchal and capitalist institutions and the way that they've been mediated by global trends and by national cultures. If we look back to our ancient history, high mortality once made high fertility pretty necessary for economic and military success. And many civilizations adopted patriarchal institutions that forced women to specialize in care provision, ensuring a cheap supply of family labor and rewarding high fertility. Capitalist development, technological change, destabilized many of those patriarchal institutions, often in contradictory ways with some positive and some negative uh, consequences. And this institutional change has led to new forms of distributional conflict over the cost of social reproduction. Who's going to pay for raising well-educated productive children? Who's going to pay for security in old age? Who's going to pay for health care? And this is very apparent in the evolution of the welfare state, a major function of which is redistributing money between the generations. In fact, more money between the young and old than between different classes, than between the rich and the poor. And to some extent, in almost all affluent countries, the benefits of raising children have been socialized by taxing the working age population to support the health and retirement of the elderly. And uh, that um, uh, process has really significant economic uh, consequences. So now we're seeing states, and this is especially true in Korea, uh, beginning to socialize more of the costs of children, providing greater public subsidies. But in general, they've underestimated the actual costs. Um, and women's willing, they've also underestimated, I think, women's willingness to voluntarily continue to pay them. And these are factors that are contributing to pretty uh, significant fertility decline. So specialization in care provision is always going to be disadvantageous to some extent because it's difficult to individually capture the economic benefits. And the thing that's being produced, human capabilities, is not for sale, but the services that are provided by human capabilities are really crucial to economic success. So this leads to a kind of moral principle that responsibilities for care provision have to be equitably shared through achievement of a better balance between family work and paid work, as well as between men and women. So what do we do now? What are the, uh, you know, what are the, the kind of policy implications um, or strategy implications of this account of the care economy? Well, I don't think we need to uh, worry excessively about the low replacement fertility, it will not have terrible consequences. And in fact, it will have some environmental advantages, but we have to adapt to it by investing more in the capabilities of our children, increasing the productivity of the younger generation to make up for the decline in, in, in numbers. Uh, but eventually 
uh, as global and national populations decline, which is pretty inevitable, we're going to have to learn how to stabilize them. And this is a problem that's fairly similar to the problem of stabilizing global climate. It's one that's likely going to require a lot of cooperation and a lot of new social institutions that need to be developed in a collaborative and democratic way. But it's also going to require a pretty fundamental reorientation of priorities away from economic growth defined in terms of gross domestic product, things that are bought and sold. And it's going to require recognition of the intrinsic and also the extrinsic value, that is the long run economic value of producing and developing and maintaining human capabilities in an ecologically sustainable process of economic growth. So COVID-19 has taught us a lot, but here, here are the lessons that I would emphasize. Economic growth itself does not deliver health and well-being. Spending on children and parents is not a bribe or a waste. It's the most important investment that we can make. Um, spending on a large elderly population is not a burden or a source of unproductive spending or something that's going to slow growth it too is an investment it's an investment in our own hopes for longevity and a reduced depreciation as it were of human capital so i'm going to end with a few useful resources to connect you if you're interested with what i see as a pretty global movement to bring care to the forefront of the economic agenda. Uh, the United Nations has sponsored a global alliance for care. Uh, there are a lot of resources there and a lot of activism that is emerging around this global alliance. There's uh, a new project called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. The, Scot the Scottish economy has kind of stepped forward um, insisting that it's going to develop a new economic plan that's going to really highlight uh, well-being rather than uh, uh, economic growth as conventionally uh, uh, defined. And I'm hoping and optimistic that other countries will also be joining the Well-Being Economy Alliance. Uh, the the um, organization uh, Oxfam, multi um, lateral non-governmental organization has developed something called a care policy scorecard which i think is a really great tool for assessing country progress uh, towards an enabling policy environment on care and it's it doesn't actually provide the scores it tells people how they can score their own country's uh, policies uh, in a systematic way to create more basis for for international comparison and uh so i'm hoping that there will uh, be some interest in, in filling out the scorecard um, in detail um, for, for Korea. Thank you very much for your attention, and I am very much looking forward to the opportunity to discuss these issues with you further. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful uh, presentation. Uh, you point out some critical limitations of current e economy and talk about the meaningful insights of care economy. And most of all, we can learn about uh, important implication of care economy for Korean society. Thank you. And let me move on to the Professor Toronto. Please proceed your presentation. The topic of presentation is care advances, sustains, and enhances democracy. It is an honor for me to be here and join you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Thank you all to, for the organizers for inviting me to this um, important discussion in this context. And I wanna thank the organizers for the invisible, caring, organizing work that they've been doing. Caring democracy provides a way to create a more sustainable form of life. Social inequality, unlimited exploitation of our human and natural resources is making our current global way of life unsustainable. At the moment, because we've paid so much attention to care during the pandemic, I have a tiny bit of optimism that perhaps people are beginning to pay attention to care. But we need really to think quite radically differently about a politics of care 
in order to achieve the kind of economic changes that my dear colleague Nancy Fulbright has suggested to us. But democracies and care seem to be contradictory. Democracy is about equality. Care is about helping take care of people who are, as Nancy just pointed out, often dependent. How can people who are dependent be equal? Forget it, leave care out of democracy. But in fact, care starts from everyone's interdependence. Um, it starts from the idea that people are always going to be relying on one another, whether they see it or not. And those people who think they are independent, those of us who are relatively self-sufficient adults, seem to be ignoring the reality that we began our lives in extraordinary dependence. We will probably end our lives in extraordinary dependence. And that every day we depend upon others to provide us with goods and services, which make it possible for us to go on living what we think of as our autonomous lives. Those people who are interdependent, those people who are at the top often don't even see the care work being done for them. And as a result, they ignore it. And the end result is that we end up with a really unjust situation. Let me begin with an empirical observation. In a, this question has been asked by public opinion people for a very long time. It's the question, do you, do you agree or disagree that most elected officials care what people like them think? And it wasn't until recently it suddenly hit me. This is a question where they actually use the word care. They ask what officials think. And the median was that 64% of people disagreed with this question. Um, in Korea, you can see it was 62%. In the United States, it was 71%. So people don't think elected officials care much about them as ordinary people. And by the way, political scientists who have looked closely to see whose political agenda actually gets implemented discover um, that it's not the people's agenda that gets implemented, quite the contrary. It's the agenda of those who are wealthy. Gillens and Page go so far as to call the United States an oligarchy, not a democracy. To me, what's extraordinary about this is not only the fact that officials ignore citizens, but the fact that citizens don't seem to care very much about the fact that officials ignore them. Why aren't people ignore, angry or upset now, it may be because they're apathetic or powerless. But I think a more productive and disturbing idea is that people accept the situation because they believe it is acceptable, because they agree implicitly with the argument that the political leaders have more important things to care about. And what they care about is the economy. Going forward, I'm going to argue the problem is uh, is with wealth care. And I will argue that if we think about the problem in this way, then we will recognize how we can fix it. Wealth care is a new term. I'm sorry to use it, but it comes from Harry Frankfurt's uh, very nice essay called The Importance of What We Care About. And what I mean by wealth care is the growth of wealth is the central value, activity, and purpose of a society and that a society's reward should go to those who create and grow wealth since they are the most worthy members of society. Now, this is similar to winner-take-all capitalism or neoliberalism, but the emphasis here is on wealth as a value and a justification for political action. Welfare, wealth care is deeply familistic. It's about passing wealth on to the next generation. And it is in that way patriarchal, biased by race, religion, ethnicity, and so on. People who are really wealthy use the state to generate wealth. They use all kinds of mechanisms to make the ends of the political system somehow conform with their production of greater and greater wealth. And this is true not only in things like the military industrial complex, privatization of public services, uh, but also down to the level of um, 
the way that prisons are run in the United States. It goes throughout using the state to find sources for greater and greater wealth. The end result of this is that it is deeply undemocratic. Um, in a book by Nancy McLean, um, she wrote, she quoted someone who is a member of the public choice revolution. These are people who argue that we can in fact quantify everything in public, um, in, in economic terms. The public choice revolution, this way of accounting for everything, rings the death knell of the political we. I like that statement because it points out that the political we, citizens, are in fact irrelevant from this standpoint. Now, oligarchic wealth then shapes the rest of the political economy in a way. The work that is most valued is the work that is work that helps what, what Jeffrey Winters calls the income defense industry. And it's hostile to care because care is expensive, care is time intensive, and as Nancy pointed out, it's hard to exploit. You don't get as much profit, if you get any profit, out of care. But there's one final limit to wealth that's really bad, and that is wealth care has no limits. Its logic is inherently hostile to sustainability. And this goes all the way back to Thomas Hobbes telling us that even if we get enough money for ourselves, we can't possibly have enough, enough money because if the other people get wealthier, then our relative wealth falls. And so there is, in Hobbes's language, a restless desire for power after power, which seizes only when we die. So how are we going to fix this? The second point I want to make is that we need to force political elites to care. Citizens have to act in order to get people in political office to change their priorities. I've already suggested to you that the political order now reflects the interests of the wealthy. And that wealth care depoliticizes public life. Increasingly, people are told that they should only be thinking about themselves, their own families, and their own increasingly precarious economic position. If you're only um, thinking about your own economic position, you see everyone else as the competitor, there's no way to create common force together. And that is increasingly happening as the economy becomes more and more difficult for people to, um, up to um, work within. In a very scary book published in 2008, Sheldon Wolin, the book was called Democracy Incorporated, talked about an idea he called inverted totalitarianism. Here was Wolin's starting insight. What would it feel like to live inside a totalitarian system? How would you know you were living in a totalitarian system? After all, everything that was being fed to you told you that you were free and you had lots of things to distract you, lots of ways to think of yourself as free and lots of ways to think of yourself as uh, capable and so on. Wolin argued that people need to become much more active as citizens to give up the stance of passively accepting what political parties offer them and to start thinking instead about, again, what they care about. In reality, the research shows that people support redistributive policies. People think it's a good idea to, to tax the wealthy and give money to, to people who need it. People are really committed to justice when you ask them in public opinion polls. When you ask them about the environment, most people are worried about the state of the global climate and want to do more to try to do something about it. But if you listen to political debates in the United States, especially, I think, um, you would never know that these are the actual prefer preferences of citizens. So we need to convince the officials to do something about this, but how do we do it? If we have been, as I suggest, turned into passive recipients of political life, if our institutions that would serve as political conduits have been taken from us, what can we do, in fact, to learn to make change? And here is where I really think putting care and democracy together becomes helpful. 
Because the way we learn to make political change is by caring. What people want, they will say, is to live in a more caring world. Here's a quotation from Naomi Klein, uh, the Canadian journalist. When people spoke about the world they wanted, the words care and caretaking came up again and again, care for the land, for the planet's living systems, and for one another. As we talked, that became a frame within which everything else seemed to fit. The need to shift from a system based on endless taking from the earth and from one another to a culture based on caretaking, the principle that when we take, we also take care and give back. Now, such a way of caring is not impossible. Citizens need to act to support democratic principles such as rule of law and majority rule while protecting minority rights and to guarantee human rights. But they also need to recognize that in order to be a democratic citizen, you need to have the character of a democratic citizen, which requires that you be interested in others, that you would be willing to do as the political philosopher Daniel Allen says, you have to be willing to talk to strangers and you have to be willing to learn from them. The way we learn to do that, to be empathetic, is through our own caring practices. So what do we do? We follow the advice of Emma Willard, who said, we need to do everything. From the bottom up, movements need to operate in caring and democratic ways. The Black Lives Movement, for example, is able to do so. And from the top down, government policies also can spur citizens to care. For example, after World War II, the United States passed the, Bill, the GI Bill of Rights and gave enormous benefits to the men, mostly men, who were returning from war. Lots of problems with that policy, but one of the benefits of it was, even if you control for education, class, people's backgrounds, the people who received those benefits did more in civil society and public life. They became members of groups, they supported people, they joined teams, they helped others out. And they, when asked about it, they said the reason they did it is because of the benefits that they had received. So life experience of care is a, can become a guide to political life, which makes me more optimistic that our experience in the pandemic may be a way for us to open up some of the cracks in the political system and point to the ways that what we care about is not what we should care about. We should care about people, the planet, and not only about wealth. So care democracy can turn these vicious circles of disengagement, fear, and competition into virtuous circles of trust, solidarity, engagement, and care. Overcoming inequalities in existing democratic societies will be a key way to global sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Professor Toronto. Uh, uh, that was uh, like the intuitive presentation. And you present uh, not only the concept of caring democracy, but also suggest some practical directions to change politics for the, you know, to reach the caring democracy. Thank you. And finally, let me move on to the Mr. Che, the precede your presentation. And topic of presentation is distributive web of care. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks to both of you who presented earlier. And super happy to be here. 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. Um, it's just by a pure coincidence and luck that I'm presenting here. I'm a visual artist. Um, I'm very new to this field, and I have to thank uh, Professor Kim Young Mi who invited me, and then also He Gang for moderating. And I, I used to live in the United States, and you know I would go to conferences. And the first thing that I would do is actually to look up the indigenous tribes of people who came before the colonizers and give acknowledgement to the land and their history. And I was actually thinking of doing that for here. And it turns out my grandfather used to live in the mountain just <laughs> around the corner. So I was like, oh, hi, grandpa. Um, he passed away, but here I am. So as a visual artist um, and a storyteller, I work with technology and also educational performances. And I'm really interested in human relationship to technology and the built environment. And I think the 
biggest thing that the artist can do is to ask questions. And I like to ask questions about contradictions because contradictions, you know, like it bears a lot of truth in them. Sometimes the contradictions are violent, but that's just the reality of our lives. In this talk, I ask, how can we degrow the abuse of power? And what do I mean by that? Is that sustainability and development, other words, uh, growth, are oftentimes in contradiction of each other because of the inherent power structure in the idea of growth. So instead of you know, growing or accelerating, especially in terms of uh, economical and po political growth, can we think about degrowing the power towards the model of care and interdependence? And this is, again, echoing a lot of things that the previous presenters have uh, raised. It's helpful to think about technology in more metaphoric ways. So here's a drawing that I made. It's a slice of the earth, but it's also a technical stack. So at the very core, in the solid level, we have physics. Um, it's, a, you know, it's just uh, rare earth minerals and other kinds of uh, natural materials that become the building blocks of the computers today. And we beam through all these levels of abstraction and we have code, we have algorithm and applications and networks. And we expand over to the more invisible layer of the cloud computing. I think there's a lot of power, there's a lot of like possibilities of abstraction and poetics to look at complex subject matter. So I try to abstract that technical stack into something more simple. And at the core, there's a thing layer. And at the very end, there's a nothing layer. So it's this existential question about being and not being. And this really mirrors how electricity works of zeros and one and how logic works, true and false, which are all the building blocks of computers. And the, this approach of thinking about computers are important because the society that we live in actually uh, imitate how technologies are built, which is a problem in itself. The internet is arguably the most uh, important invention of our lifetime. And it has a really interesting history, initially designed as a communication protocol and a network for, um, you know, for the military operations. It also became a kind of a utopian home of, you know, sort of the, you know, outcast of the academia and the kind of counterculture. But the reality is that it kind of became a giant shopping mall. <laughs> and I had a chance to meet some of the early pioneers of the World Wide Web, and they were saying, like, we are really surprised that, you know, five handful corporations actually are dominating the internet. They had a much more optimistic view, or possibly a democratic view of how it could be used. So as a performance artist, I often work with various communities. So this time it was in New York City at the Whitney. And we invited a group of friends and collaborators, oftentimes members from the disability community, to this lecture performance about the future of the internet. And you can tell that this is before COVID-19. <laughs> this is actually the 2018. So we were able to gather in a room and really you know, connect physically. So what we are doing was creating a physical web with pink strings. And we did it in a way that was uh, inclusive. So a blind audience w was able to join, a deaf audience was able to join. So it was a collective caring for the making of the internet. The key message in this work is can we think about care instead of control? And you can recall that control is a really important part of technology. Most of the internet protocols are about controlling one part of the machine to the other part of the machine. 
and also building things like technical things that um, reflect the vision of decentralization and also care. And here is a small computer that is serving a local Wi-Fi, a peer-to-peer -peer network where the audience member were able to join um, locally and experience a garden, a virtual garden. Here's a short video clip of the event. So COVID-19 and other personal and professional changes have brought me back to Korea. And I'm very excited about this change. Uh, for, for one, I could spend more time in nature. And I've been actually thinking about our relationship with not only other humans, but non-humans, the living and non-living things. So I do not romanticize nature as this you know, happy place. It's actually really vicious and competitive. You know, there's a lot happening between two species. But let's talk about the mutualism and competition and think about like everything in between. And can we imagine a poetic agency where nature um, exists in interdependence in a caring way? And can we think about care not as a selfish care, but a care for others in coexistence? Because if, as you know, like self-care is this neoliberal branding of like, you know, getting more shampoos and, you know, your Apple, you know, TV things that are supposed to help you feel better. So let's resist the packaging of care <laughs> into a, you know, sort of the branding. But think about how care as a code, care as a protocol, and care as a form of technology. So inspired by, you know, the return to the nature, I've been creating these virtual gardens that exist in computer network and also on people's phones. And this is really an investigation about three types of organism. The one is fungus, mushrooms. The other is lichen. Um, in Korean, we call it a jiuryu, which I find quite um, beautiful because it means that it's, it's an organism that's covering up the earth. It's like a coat for the earth and moss. And here's an animation of a moss that is you know, sort of developing over time, a generative model. And this is a photo from Jeju Island. Um, which is the southernmost part of Korea. My friend Kwak Sojin has taken this photo. And you can see that these organisms are always in coexistence. So mushroom, lichen, and fungus. Garden 저는 최태윤 작가입니다. 이 작업은 여러 엔지니어, 디자이너, 프로듀서와 함께 만들었고 지금 이곳에는 그분들을 대신해 여러 배우와 수어 통역사들과 함께 있습니다. 분산된 돌봄의 웹 시리즈 so that was just a short clip from a documentation um, of the project where I speak in Korean and we've worked with a you know, sign language interpreter uh, who is also a deaf artist. So in these works, I've been thinking a lot about access and inclusion for disabled folks. And I'm, I'm learning a lot. And maybe we can get, come back to this question of care and um, you know, disability in the Q&A, but essentially, you know, the care used to have a negative connotation of somebody, you know, needing care of the other. But could we, could we reclaim that word to something more proactive, 
something that is uh, you know mutually beneficial for the one who are receiving and giving. And I conclude um, by asking the initial question, which is the, how can we degrow the abuse of power? Can we unlearn the conventional model of growth, which is you know, based on acceleration, accumulation, and sort of, you know, even the sustainable development model, you know, it really, con it's built on the context and the framework that the growth is positive. And can we redefine that growth or actually ask, should things grow at all? <laughs> So how can we unlearn the structures of power in place and care towards interdependence between various communities and create together? There's a word that Donna Haraway often uses, which is a sympoiesis. And it's taking something from symbiosis, like coexistence, and poiesis. And poetics, is, it means to create, to give form. So this sympoiesis is a how do we create together? And I think that's the key, is a, rather than a competition or kind of mere co coexistence, I think idea of co-creating through our means creatively, innovatively, and also caringly could be our way for the future of care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Che. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. It is very interesting to know how the care, the interconnectedness or interdependency among uh, living creature and non-living creature can challenge the power structure and the realm of art. Thank you. And from now on, we will have, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much for all three presentations. And from now on, we will have a Q&A time and let me ask some questions to our panelists. And the, this is my, the, the first questions to the professor uh, Forbret. And what do you think is the biggest problem in the capitalist market economy where care is devalued or undervalued? Uh, if so, what important changes do you think are necessary for a sustainable economy that reflects the care? You know, I think the first necessary thing is to change the way we think about it. Um, and I think what Taeyun said about unlearn, unmake, mm -hmm. undo, that's exactly right. Uh, I think we really need to challenge um, economists and the way they tell us uh, what our priorities should be and uh, how we should how we should behave, uh, which also links to Joan's uh, concept of wealth care. Um, and this may seem like a little a, a bit of, of an abstract um, goal just to change the way we think. But in fact, I think it, it really is a necessary step um, to a kind of democratic process of rethinking our, our whole system of care provision. And that's what I think is, is necessary. I, I don't think we want to appoint one person, especially not one economist, <laughs> to say, oh, this is how we should, we should organize it this way, or organize it that way. We, what we need to do is create a kind of discourse um, and, and a kind of vocabulary in which we can all help each other think more collaboratively about, about change. Okay, thank you, thank you. And the next question is for the Professor Toronto. Uh, you talk about caring democracy and democracy is very important normative value and the practice and there have been a lot of the discussions on the theory of the democracy and practice of democracy and given that what important advantage do you think that caring democracy over other kinds of democracy and what benefit can you get from the talking about caring democracy 
Thanks. That's a very good question. And the answer is that the language of democracy it can be used in lots of different ways, but it has largely lost its meaning in our societies and become a language of economy and management. Um, it, it should be a language of... So what care offers is a language that we're familiar with. We know how to care for each other. We know how we have to struggle, in fact. There's often conflict in care. It's not easy. It's, it's, we have different ideas about what the right thing to do is. But when we're putting ourselves in the situation of trying to resolve those conflicts, we somehow know how to do it. And that's what citizens actually do know about public life. And that's what they could know about and do in making democracy. Uh, Nancy's right, Taiwan is right. What we need to do is unlearn, uh, unmake, undo. But we won't be left with nothing. What we'll be left with is what we do every day, which is take care, uh, figure out how to make things work. And so thinking to democracy as structures to make care easier, using the language we already know, looking at the injustices and imbalances of care, start there and we'll begin to see how to make things more equal. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And the, the last question for the, the Mr. Che and Taeyun. <laughs> Can I call your name Taeyun? It is very interesting to approach the value of care, like the connectedness, attentiveness, or in interdependency, or relationship among humans, and relationship among the humans, and living creature, and even non-living creatures, uh, in, in the realm of art. Uh, most fundamentally, what motivate you to try to incorporate care into the realm of art? Yeah, uh, um, you know, there, there are a few backgrounds for it, but most importantly, I was being informed and inspired regarding um, the conditions of labor economy, including domestic workers, um, informal workers, mm -hmm. that's what it's called, um, mm -hmm. people who sort of don't have a legal status to mm -hmm. work and also domestic work, obviously, and, and the issues of migration of the labor force. And this is uh, something that I've observed firsthand in United States, but also in Southeast Asia, where I was working in Hong Kong and other places. So it's a global migration of labor. And I think understanding that care is, you know, it's a really valuable asset for any society like you cannot exist without those care workers, but they often get the least amount of recognition and financial co compensation. I think the case is quite similar in South Korea too, because I, my studio is in uh, Paju, mm -hmm. in a more industrial area, mm -hmm. and the workers are you know, quite diverse um, in terms of their ethnicity. And I think the kind of struggle that they face as a migrant worker in Korea are really severe, but we, do not actually get to hear about it very much. So the invisible layers of care exist everywhere. Um, as an artist, I think my attention has always been to see the cracks <laughs> and see like what that leads to. So I think the, there was a crack between um, within the arts institution that I was working with and also my own community. And that those cracks were actually filled by the labor of those who provide care including service workers and including emotional labor of many people who work there. So noticing that and also just the disparity of the care work and tech work mm -hmm. because you know the engineers are prized for being careless. <laughs> you know like the tech gurus always say like uh, you know deploy and fail and deploy again or demo or die like all these rhetorics of neoliberal productivity, which is quite toxic in real life. Like you cannot just like fall and come back up. That's just not a real thing. <laughs> so I think those few things were in my mind as I was working with care. And this led to a series of work called Distributed Web of Care. Mm -hmm. 
good. Thank you. So, I mean, you talk about other times with me and uh, some other the artist that dealing with the care. So if, if we have more time, let me hear about those stories. Okay. Uh, another question, it's a common question to all of three panelists. And this is the question. How do you think that care can contribute to social sustainability? Or how do, how do you see the role of care or meaning of care in discussing the social sustainability? So please feel free to speak from the perspective of the field that you belong to. Okay, and the Professor Forre, could you respond first? to this question? Well, I think a lot of the economic problems that we face today require cooperation. Global climate change is a very good example. Mm -hmm. In my view, adjusting to below replacement fertility is also something that's going to require cooperation. But we have an economic system that's very much premised on competition. And uh, so I think this discourse of care is really crucial and, and, and also of caring democracy. It's, mm -hmm. it's really central to the task of developing more effective cooperation. I don't think we can cooperate to solve problems together unless we trust each other and care about each other. And if we don't, um, we're all going to be in pretty serious trouble. Um, I also think we should really emphasize the parallels between physical climate change and social climate change. And I think a century from now, we're gonna look back on this period as one in which our, our social environment was degraded, our ability to to be with one another and to work together has been degraded. Uh, our level of mental illness and unhappiness and depression and abuse and crime, these are all social pathologies mm -hmm. that we should be monitoring and measuring and trying to minimize the same way that we think about global warming, we should think about social cooling or I don't know. So let's put sustainability Let's, let's think of sustainability in both physical and social terms and bring care to the forefront there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you discuss about the cooperation. Is there any like global cases that to achieve the co cooperation for the uh, social sustainability? Well, I think that the, the links that I provided at the end of my talk, mm -hmm. I think represent mm -hmm. What, what I think are kind of nascent efforts, but there are many, many others. And um, it just a lot of, uh, a lot of um, efforts to reach out and, and coordinate. And I think one of the really interesting features of it is it's very international. Uh, and so it's already framed as, as a project that can't be conducted on a, you know, in a single country. Um, I happen to think that the that UN Women is an organization that has been very much in the forefront of efforts to promote uh, a care agenda. And the UN is a good example of an international multilateral organization that's not, has had limited success because of lack of cooperation from, from member nations, especially the most powerful um, and, and self-interested uh, uh, members. But th I think that's something that we could change. Good, thank you. And the Toronto, could you respond to these questions? Care can contribute to social sustainability if we extend care to everyone and everything, living, non-living, mm -hmm. um, all of those things have to somehow be supported. Tae Yoon, thank you for mentioning the need to support 
domestic workers, the people at the bottom. And another example of the kind of international cooperation that Professor Fulbury was just talking about, of course, is the International Labor Organization's development of a domestic workers agenda and support for those workers and their rights. We know what caring can feel like. We know how to think about it. But care can also help us bring issues of sustainability down to the concrete question, what can I do in a way that is not just individualized or self-serving? And how can I, in my daily life, contribute to sustainability? Um, it, as long as people think that it's somebody else's problem, it won't get solved. And the only way to make people begin to recognize that they have some stake and some ability to change things is actually to try to change them. Good, thank you. What can I do? That's the important <laughs> question even for me. And the Taeyun, could you respond? Yeah, and um, also thanks to Nancy for mm. mentioning not only the physical degradation, but social degradation that we experience. Yes. Um, I think we need to speak about polarization in our mm -hmm. society um, in many different ways. Um, and let's just be real, it's like, can you actually care for somebody who you do not agree with? Mm -hmm. Can you care for somebody who defy your existence and make it really hard for you to stay in a certain country, for example? or somebody who does not care for you in return. Interdependence is such an attractive idea, but it's also quite idyllic. Um, most likely, there's a, some uneven balance of power within any kinds of relationships. I think it's, it's important to mention the labor force and also racism, because I think that's actually race and class uh, and sexism is something that exist today in any part of the world and mm -hmm. it will most likely to continue. So therefore, there's an uneven um, uh, distribution of power and also hostility between different parties. So uh, care is great, but to implement that in real life takes a lot of, a lot of trust, mm -hmm. a lot of um, equity. Uh, ec by equity, I mean um, sort of transparency and accountability between different parties. You know, we've experienced such, such a really dramatic um, tension of racial conflict in the United States. Um, it's, you know, it's really needless to say how, how difficult that was for everyone and how it will continue to scar the generation of young people. So I, I feel a lot of gravity about asking for care mm -hmm. of the young people because I know it's actually quite hard for them. And as somebody who's, you know, really thinking about community and building different relationships. Um, care is, is a difficult, it's a difficult ask. So I think we should not underestimate the labor and commitment that we are asking other people. Okay, thank you. Like the interconnectedness and the solidarity among the people will be the important source for the care to each other. Okay. Uh, we have um, like the six minutes left and the uh, if you have other question to other panelists please welcome to speak up to your questions or the comments Taeyun, do you have any like the questions to the other panelists um, not right now but mm -hmm. I'll be happy to just chat for five minutes with you. <laughs> well, I would like to know from Taiyun how we can uh, see more of your work. Yeah, my website. <laughs> All right, tell, and, us, your, and tell also, us your website. Yeah, just taeyunchoi.com. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, I guess I could use the time to just talk about my friend's work who I've discovered right. in Korea related to this topic. Mm -hmm. um, Higang asked, are there other artists and designers working with care? And I said, yes. Um, there's a book by uh, Kim Ta Eun, and the title is uh, Motherhood, S S Artist, and Care, uh, Self, Motherhood, Artist, and Self. And it's a bilingual book, and it talks about just the labor of being an artist and a parent. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, a, a primary parent for their child. 
and she's working on her second book about fatherhood. And I think that's actually a really interesting thing. Mm. And the other is um, there's a group called uh, Diana Lab, like Diana as as if the princess, but lab. And um, they've been mapping stores in Seoul that are wheelchair accessible. Mm. And surprisingly, there's only a handful of independent stores, bookstores, cafes that wheelchair users could go in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a form of care mm -hmm. of, you know, making spaces more accessible and including more diverse bodies mm -hmm. uh, and abilities into a space of celebration. Um, I think that's just kind of a practice of care mm -hmm. that I'm inspired by. Okay, good. Like even in Korea, there's the movement for care movement up here in the recent days, like in Korean Chongchan and Omada, mothers for the, the politic, political politics will be an important element for the care movement in South Korea right now. Okay, if, if you don't have any other questions. No, you don't have any other questions. Professor Toronto, do you have a question? No. One more, more comment, which is there, can, there are also forms of bad care and evil mm -hmm, care. Mm -hmm. And you can't just say care and expect it to be magical. Um, the only forms of care that I really want to endorse are those that are democratic, mm -hmm. inclusive, um, and sustainable, because otherwise you could say we're caring for the world by um, digging up all that oil because people need to drive their cars, right? And you don't want people to be able to say that. So care by itself is a concept. It's not a whole theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. That's why I insist that it be put in the context of um, democracy of people being actually uh, willing to treat others and the world with respect and dignity. Yeah, I really agree. And I think there's a new tendency of care washing <laughs> as mm -hmm. yeah. like a greenwashing. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes like corporations and institutions demanding care from the most mm -hmm. marginalized mm -hmm. people That's and right. kind of normalizing that as a way of being. And I think they're getting away with, you know, kind of stealing the mm -hmm. labor. So. I think care could be double, you know, edged sword. Mm -hmm. And I think as the discourse becomes more popular, we may see abuse of this language yes. and lack of accountability. Um, I think we need to scale down. Like that's my whole thing is that like, if it's just like, to, if you focus on like your immediate environment and relationship with other members of the community, care becomes so much more manageable mm -hmm. as opposed to a global scale. And I think it just really needs to start at home and with the immediate surroundings. Good, good. Like, I also fully agree with you and Professor Tonto. It is easy to speak up the care, but it is very difficult to achieve the good care, inclusive and democratic care. So I think it's time to also talk about the good care in our discussion. Uh, okay, then I'm very happy to take this opportunity to discuss the new perspective of care. And most of all, I'm very delighted to have a lively conversation with those distinguished our panelists. Okay, this is the end of this plenary session and thank you for the, our panelists and speakers and the audience. Oh, yeah. And we should also thank all the invisible labor that mm -hmm. got into this panel, which is the <laughs> interpreters, video folks, right. volunteers. There's like dozens of people that are not visible. And I think, you know, they also are making this possible. So that's the form of a holistic care is to recognize everyone behind the scene. Thank you for pointing out and thank you for all those people who are working for this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim and panelists for reminding us that care was and is always a part of our social fabric. Interesting key words and phrases such as trust, equity, human capability, not the product of human capability, interdependence and degrowth 
in relation to care and sustainability will be on our minds as conventional socioeconomic and political models continue to fail. Labor and commitment and inclusive are also words that will also resonate. So thank you again. Uh, now we will have a brief break and we'll resume at 10.30 a.m. Korean time. Thank you. Thank you.